Hey everybody, this is Greg Pedix, founder, curator, docent, and gift shop employee of the Pedixonian Institute of Comic Book Studies. Today we're going to be looking at Quagmire Comics, number one, even though there was no, no other ones of these. Uh, this was published by Kitchen Sink Enterprises. Dennis Kitchen admitted in, in an interview that this was a dead, a quote-unquote dead. It was a very early uh, underground comic, um, definitely by Kitchen Sink standards. This is one of their first within their first five publications. Very strange underground. It's almost like a ground level comic like um, that came out later in the mid seventies, like Star Reach, things like that. Um, it's uh, kind of genre orientated. Um, it has no radical politics, it has no sex. There's not really any gore. So it's almost like a clean underground. And you can tell by this cover, these guys are probably influenced by uh, Marvel Comics and stuff. This just looks like a kind of a sci-fi fanzine. I really like this, though. The color registration, the psychedelic, godlike being. Pretty groovy stuff. Terrible logo, though. I wish they worked a little more on that. So here we have a little uh, inside front cover introduction that kind of explains... Like, uh, there's this new phenomenon called underground comics. Quagmire's one of them, but uh, it's neither dirty nor radical. And uh, at the end it says, give them a little time and they'll become as filthy as, and perverted as other underground cartoonists. I assume this is written by Dennis Kitchen. He blames the cleanliness of this comic on the fact that the two creators, Pete Poplaski and Dale Cupers, are from Green Bay. Where, uh, Everything's kind of clean. All they do is watch Packers games and go to church bazaars. So we start with the story by Pete Poplaski. Uh, Pete Poplaski worked at Kitchen Sink Comics for like decades. He did lots of production work for them. Every now and then he'd draw something. And it was always exquisite. So even back in 1970 when this comic came out, he's already got his chops pretty laid down. Unfortunately, his storytelling and writing chops are not... Almost every comic in this comic is really just, I don't know if it's just a failure of their storytelling or they just wanted to make a little head scratcher of a story, but none of them really pay off and they really don't make much sense. But the art's really nice and it is kind of fun to read them and try to figure out what the guy was trying to say, what the artist was trying to say. So this one is called Survivor. Um, we see that it looks like a storage locker, not even like a bunker. And this old man comes out. I first assumed, like, oh, is this after, you know, the apocalyptic nuclear war? But the earth seems beautiful and fine. And he's just wandering around. And then later on, a young man comes out of this locker. Look how great this heart is. It's all this pointillism. Be really nice ink work. That's a really nice panel. And so this guy comes up to the old man and kills him with a rock. No explanation why. And then an alien comes out of the locker. And he goes up to the young man who tries to defend himself, tries to grab a weapon. This alien's got like psychic powers and just using his mind, he like kills the guy. Really nice art. And that's it. I have no idea what What's going on? I don't know if he's dying in this last panel or if that's just him using his psychic powers to finish off this guy. Don't know. Now, I never heard of this guy before, Dale Cupers. And uh, I love his crazy style. It's kind of like uh, Gilbert Shelton, but more psychedelic. And this is a goofy story. This is the most linear story, or at least the one that actually has some gags in it. It makes some kind of sense. It, uh, one day this mysterious statue appears in Times Square and uh, around the same time there's an abrupt appearance of a gigantic chicken 
flying through the skies. Some people think it's a harbinger of doom. Some people think it's it, some people think it's the alien of salvation. I'm sorry, the angel of salvation. But it's a big mystery. Yeah, that's very Gilbert Shelton. And so, uh, nobody knows his name until one day he flies into the sky and thunders out, "My name is Chicken Fat." From whence had come this mysterious champion of the obscurity called good and nemesis of the question called evil? Is he an angel of the Lord or disciple of the devil? And moreover, is he an alien? If so, he'll have to register or be deported. So then we flash back to the origin of chicken fat. Uh, it's in some kind of future where the Grand Canyon is just this giant uh, junkyard. And uh, dump trucks are just piling crap into it. And a strange green egg rolls out of its carton and plummets to the deepest recesses of the vast dump. And under such intense pressure, the embryonic chemicals underwent a strange change. Eerie green radiation emanated from it. So the military has no luck even getting close to it. The fumes... Uh, above Grand Canyon, planes can't even fly through it. A nuclear submarine tries to go through the the Grand Canyon dump, but can't make it. Can't make it through the sludge. And the Army and National Guard give up too. They can't make it through. But this genius inventor, billionaire, Elmer Smolch, he makes a ship that cuts through the trash like butter and he gets that egg he finds the green egg and he brings it back to his headquarters i really like this guy's style i wish he did more comics so here's his fortress you know uh compound corporate compound and uh he shoots the egg with some rays and the egg cracks open and out comes chicken fat. I really like this design. It almost looks like if uh, Philip Droulet tried to draw some goofy comic, like a, a funny comic for kids or something. And uh, chicken fat is born unto the world. This will continue later in the book. Dino Dillies by Peter Poplaski once again. This is a kind of a goofy comic featuring dinosaurs in the Cretaceous period. Really nicely drawn. Really nice cartooning. Uh, this thing falls out of the sky. And this one dinosaur finds it. He thinks it's a miracle. And uh, he's telling all the other dinosaurs. But then it cracks open. Turns out it's a little alien spaceship. This little guy comes out. And the dinosaurs don't seem to be impressed. They just start praying to the lava god. And the alien says, these are things must have brains about that big. Yeah, don't really understand why that comic was needed, except for just some nice art. Here we have Chicken Fat Part 2. I'm pretty sure a lot of time passed. Because all of a sudden his art style is way different. It looks like he's using charcoal pencils. and it's. I don't like it as much. Um... I, I thought it was just a perfect style in that part one, but uh, this is still pretty nice stuff. So Chicken Fat is introducing himself to that uh, genius billionaire scientist. And over the few months, the scientist uh, gives him every kind of book and shows him TV and movies so he can learn about 20th century culture. But then one day he sees a commercial for Mrs. Crabgrass's chicken-rich flavored soup. And uh, it sets him off. And uh, it says, Great dreams of vengeance clouded the juggernaut's brain. The nations quake in terror. They wait. But no great bird appears and it seems the earth is safe. So, I, yeah, I don't know. That's how it ends. It's just like... Had, had this whole build up. Oh, what? Now Chicken Fat's gonna 
rampage through the earth to get revenge, he just disappears. Some old prospector reported seeing a monstrous bird walking the wastes of Death Valley. It's really just weird stuff. Here's another another dinosaur comic, but this time by Dale Cupers. Really nicely drawn. This is a nice illustration. <coughs> Excuse me. And this one uh, doesn't really make any sense. Don't get it at all. We're following this one uh, fan-tailed dinosaur. Cute little guy. And he's trying to get this fruit. And his tail dislodges some stuff from the stone wall. And a broken pair of eyeglasses fall down. That's the twist ending? I don't know if he's trying to say that yeah, after man destroys himself, the dinosaurs will take over the earth again. So there's going to be this detritus left behind by man's civilization. I don't know. It doesn't really matter. It's pretty badly told if you have to wonder so much. This story is just not doesn't make any sense at all. I still, I don't know why I like these, this comic. All these stories uh, have no point, almost all of them. So we have Crack by Pete Poblaski. Once again, doing that very traditional kind of mainstream art almost. I mean, this guy could have worked with Neil Adams and stuff. And this guy says, he says, I'm tired of dreams. Look at that, of stars. His face is just like melting into a Milky Way galaxy or some galaxy. Water dripped off my face as I looked into the face of the executioner. And the executioner pulls a blaster out and fires point blank at him. At first I laughed at the sudden shock. Am I dead? Then the cataclysmic divide. The whole universe is shattering, it looks like, and he's tumbling into it. It's spindly web touched me. I really like these two pages, the graphics of it. And it just says, where am I? <laughs> it's so stupid. But I fucking love this art. That is such groovy, crazy shit. I love it. And that's almost the end. We got an ad for some Kitchen Sink comics. And then we have a back cover by Pete Poplaski in a much more uh, goofy, lighthearted uh, mode. Sorry. And mood, I guess. So that's it, Quagmire Comics. I was debating whether to show this off to you because it's not very good. But something about it. Sometimes comics like this, I just... Yeah, they... They fail on one level, but I just have to keep it in the collection. I'm just, I just love flipping through it every now and then, looking at the art. Love this crazy cover, even with the shitty logo. Yeah, so I don't know. Hopefully you like looking at it and uh, doesn't make much narrative sense. And uh, But that's it, Quagmire Comics. Hope you enjoyed it, and I'll see you next time at the Pedicsonian Institute of Comic Book Studies.